Harry Klein from the Department of Statistics will talk about pattern avoidance for random permutation. Thanks a lot. Hey, it's, uh, it's good to be back. And so today I'll talk about, as the title said, pattern avoidance. But I'll be talking about pattern avoidance for uh, random permutations. So the setup is similar to one that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, the, the, one of the uh, a familiar question in enumerative combinatorics is suppose you have a permutation and there's some other permutation which is called a pattern and you want to know, given some, uh, given some pattern, how many permutations of, of a given size avoid that pattern. And what I'm going to do today is re really, in some sense, just rephrase the problem probabilistically, which instead of saying how many permutations avoid a pattern, uh, suppose we uh, draw a permutation at random and we ask, what's the probability that the permutation avoids a pattern? So these two questions are equivalent. Uh, if we think of uh, drawing a permutation uniformly at random, so if all, the, if all permutations have the same probability, then these are equivalent, we just divide by n factorial. Um, it turns out that even though, uh, even though that's more or less a trivial observation, there is some benefit to doing that. Uh, but I'll also talk about uh, a more general class of random permutations, uh, which is a non-uniform uh, distribution. Uh, which is particularly amenable to studying uh, pattern avoidance. It's called the Mallow's distribution. Okay. And this is work with Stephen DeSalvo, who's at, he's at UCLA. So when I say permutation, I'm talking about a linear order. of the set 1 up through n. And the relevant, uh, the relevant operation when we talk about pattern avoidance is if, we, if I give you a subsequence, I ask you whether or not a permutate, whether a pattern occurs at that location, that, gives a, that, that is determined by whether or not the reduction or the standardization of the elements in those locations it corresponds to the pattern. So given any word of distinct integers, the reduction is the unique order isomorphic permutation of length of length k. And I write this as red w. So uh, just as an example, if I had this sequence 5, 3, 7, uh, 6, 9, then I get the reduction by replacing the smallest element by a 1, the second smallest by a 2, and so on. Uh, so this is 2, 1, 4, 3, 5. And then we say that a permutation avoids a pattern. So if I have a permutation, I say that it avoids some pattern tau, which is just another permutation, but I'll call it a pattern. If there is no subsequence, Such that the elements that appear in the, in that's in the, in those positions of the permutation uh, reduce down to tau. So this is uh, this is what's usually meant when we say uh, pattern avoidance. Uh, but I'll also talk about what's called consecutive pattern avoidance, which is the case where 
this, this subsequence has to be uh, consecutive indices. Um, and I'll talk about both today. So as an example, let's see, we have this permutation here. So this avoids 2, 3, 1, I believe. It avoids 2, 3, 1. And it avoids, um, no? No, no. The, the 1, 4, 3 yeah, is a sub. Is a sub oh, sub 2, 3, 1. I'm sorry. No, that's not good. No, that's no, 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 no. no. That one, one, four, three would be one, three, two. No. Am I wrong? Oh, no, I'm so sorry. You're right. So, so, uh, yeah, no, yeah. so it, you, have to, you have to check every, every possible iteration, every possible subsequence, but I'm just saying there's no subsequence of length three that reduces down to two, three, one. Okay? And it avoids one, three, five as a, cons or one, two, three as a consecutive. Pattern. But it doesn't avoid one, two, three as a general so pattern. You write down, you write down one, two, three, that one goes one, three, two, or something so like that. So one, three, five, that right. corresponds to the pattern one, two, three. Yeah. Um, so, but it doesn't avoid this in consecutive, it avoids it in consecutive locations. If I only consider consecutive locations, then, I, then these are the only consecutive patterns oh, that occur. Yeah, okay. 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 So the typical question of enumeration uh, of, of the sets that avoid a pattern tau, uh, I'll use this notation just as the number of permutations. that avoid tau. And so this is the, I guess, the first question of interest, which is to enumerate these sets exactly. Uh, generally, it's very hard to do unless the pattern has a, a very nice structure or is of size 3, maybe 4, but that's not, that's not even true. So one example of this is that for every pattern of length 3, This sequence is given by uh, the Catalan numbers. But as I said, unless we unless we have a very nice pattern, this exact enumeration is out of the question, and so we all will settle for um, asymptotic, so the, the asymptotic growth rate, if we can get it which is defined by this limit, the limit of the nth root which, by, which is known to exist and be finite for all patterns tau. So this is, this is the Stanley Wolf conjecture which was proven uh, by Marcus and Tardos in 2004. Uh, so in the case of a length 3 pattern, the limit Say of avoiding one, two, three. And I, when I say this, I'm speak, I'm talking about uh, general classical avoidance here. Uh, in this case, the limit is just four. But even in the case when we go up to patterns of length five, this limit's not uh, known exactly, and the, and, uh, the bounds are, uh, I guess, they're improving, but very slowly. So there's been a, there's a lot of work in this area, and I won't cover, I won't talk about all of it or any of it really. I, I'm going to talk about uh, this problem in a, in a uh, slightly different context, which is that in all of these, in all in all of the cases I've talked about so far, we fix a pattern and then we, we ask if uh, if I give you a size n, how many permutations of that size avoid the pattern. Um, today I'm going to talk about three things 
all tied into pattern avoidance uh, for random permutations. I'm going to consider the case uh, where of large patterns. Okay. So in other words, I'm going to think about I'm going to think about patterns uh, that get that grow with n or that are large relative to n, and we have and I'm going to talk about how big is big enough to get a good approximation on the probability of, 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 avoidance, of avoidance. As I mentioned, I'll talk about random permutations. And in particular, the Mallows, uh, random permutations for the Mallows distribution. I'll talk a bit about both classical and consecutive uh, avoidance. So the Mallows, the family of, of Mallows permutations are particularly nice for consecutive avoidance, uh, whereas the uniform distribution is, is uh, nice enough to study both. And the technique that I'll highlight here is Poisson approximation. So there is There is a sheet, there are a few sheets that you could pass around if people haven't gotten uh, this handout, but that's not, that's not necessary until the end. Uh, it's just uh, a theorem that I'll use at the end, which is going to allow us to approximate the probability of avoidance using the, what's called the, the Poisson approximation, the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution it, it comes up uh, a lot in probability and statistics in a situation where we have a lot of trials each with, a, we, each with a, a small probability. So altogether, if we only expect uh, a few, one, two, three, a small number to occur on average, the Poisson distribution is often a good, uh, a good approximation to, the, to, the, uh, to, to, that, to that count, to the number of events that occur. And the theorem that I, that I have on the sheet uh, gives a way of bounding or somehow quantifying the error in the approximation. Okay, so let me introduce now the Mallows distribution. I talked about this uh, last year in the seminar, but I'll I'll talk about it again. It's a Really, all it, the, all it is, um, if you think of it combinatorially, it's a Q analog of some sense of the uniform distribution. So the uniform distribution assigns probability 1 over n factorial, equal probability to every permutation. And the Malice distribution deforms the, the uniform distribution by weighting each permutation by the number of, number of inversions. So an inversion in sigma is a pair of indices i less than j and sigma i bigger than sigma j. So this, this is just to say it's any pair of indices such that the elements in those, in those two locations are in decreasing order. And the Mallow's distribution for so it takes a parameter q, which is a positive number, and assigns probability according to uh, q raised to the power of the number of inversions. So the Mallow's distribution with parameter q. So 
this is the notation I use for the probability. It's Q raised to the power of the number of inversions divided by a normalizing constant. The normalizing constant is the Q factorial function. So And these, this is the uh, generating function associated to um, the the number of the number of permutations of n with k inversions is the um, is the coefficient of q to the k. Uh, this is this is the Mahonian triangle or the Mahonian numbers, I believe, uh, which is. Netto numbers, which are equivalent, which are equivalent to the Mahonian numbers. Okay, what, the, what did you call them? Netto, the inversion, the constant loss inversion goes back to 1973 to netto. Net, netto. Netto, N E T T O. Yeah. Okay. And then McMahon proved that the major index difference of the index is actually the most. I see. So we see if we put Q equal to 1 here, we get the uniform distribution. So that's just an, an, an notate, a note, which is a Q equals 1. Science equal probability to each, and that we recover the uniform distribution as a special case. And otherwise, the parameter Q uh, either push, pushes the distribution either towards uh, permutations with more inversions or less inversions. So if Q is bigger than 1, The permutation favors inversions, otherwise Q is less than 1. It uh, penalizes inversions. And as a knowledge distribution, so represent how far, in some sense, the permutation is from the identity? Is there anything? The number of the <coughs> inversions is wrong. Well, the number of inversions is somehow a way of quantifying how disordered the permutation yes, is. Right yeah. So this was introduced, I, I meant to say, by Colin Mallows in 1957. This is from uh, the statistics literature. This was introduced for uh, certain um, certain uh, ranking statistics, uh, but but it, it's capturing some it's capturing something something like that. Yeah. So. The nice thing about it, it turns out this distribution is quite nice to work with, uh, and it's, it's, it's easy to work with um, numerically or computationally. And I'll work over here because I'll have the, the screen come down in a bit. Um, and it, we can generate a, 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 an instance from the Malice distribution uh, according to the following simple uh, sequential construction. which makes it easy to study experimentally on a computer. So for this, we, we, all we need are n independent random variables. So we take n random variables. They're independent, but not identically distributed. Such that the case Random variable takes the value j with probability q to the minus, proportional to q to the minus j. So the norm, normalized by all possible integers between 1 and k. So for each k, xk is an in, a positive integer between 1 and k. And then we build up we build up an instance, a version of a random permutation sequentially. Uh, as follows. So we we build sigma by first putting, so we start with 
We start at the, the only permutation uh, of one element, and then given that we have Given that we've seen some permutation up to level k, and the random variable xk plus 1 takes some value j, we define sigma k plus 1. We copy, we copy these values, but we update them in some way because we append whatever we observed to the end. And then we have to update whatever we have so far to make sure that we have k plus k, we, we have all, all elements distinct. So these sigma i prime is either sigma i plus 1, as sigma i is bigger than or equal to j, and sigma i otherwise. So let me do an example. I guess this is in the way. Okay. So for example, uh, let's suppose we have uh, sequence x1, it's given like this, then what we do is we start at level 1, we start at level 1 with the permutation of 1 and then we always add to the back, so we add what we have to the back and then we bump up if we need to bump up. And here we add a 3 to the end. Nothing has to change. We don't need to change anything. And a 2. And we have to bump up anything that's bigger than or equal to 2. And 4. Okay. And by this construction, each one of these permutations is a Mallow's, it ha, is distributed according to the Mallow's distribution uh, because if, if, so I should point out that we're, a Mallow's distribution with parameter q, so here we have q to the minus power, we have 1 over q, and that's because when we have, when, when the random variable takes, when xk plus 1 takes the value j, it introduces k plus 1 minus j inversions. Okay, and so if we add all of these up, uh, the, the Q inverse here turns into a Q in the, in the distribution. And each one of these permutations is a Mallow's distribution of, of, its, of its size. And furthermore, there's some, there's some other nice properties of it, such as the way that we've built this up by building it out to the right, once we observe some pattern or some permutation in the first K locations, that pattern will, always, will persist th throughout the sequence. Okay? So, in other words, what happens in this, the pattern that we observe in any consecutive, uh, in, any, in, any, in any part of the, of the permutation is unaffected by what comes later. And also, uh, since, the, um, since the pattern, since it's, since the, the permutation is generated by a sequence of independent random variables, not overlapping pieces are independent of one another. And so the, both of these properties, which I'll uh, recap in just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll state more formally in just a second. They're they're key to our um, they're key to our use of the Poisson approximation uh, to estimate or to approximate. Uh, the probability of avoiding of certain patterns under the Mallow's distribution. Okay. Let me state this one observation here, which is the reversal. So if if sigma is a Mallow's permutation with parameter q, then its reversal, sigma r, which is the sigma, which is the permutation written in reverse, is also a Mallow's, also follows a Mallow's distribution 
but with parameter 1 over q. Okay, because every inversion in the original permutation is no longer an inversion in the reversal and vice versa. So if there's r permutations in sigma, then there will be n choose 2 minus r inversions in its reversal. This is pretty nice. Is this all in Mellow's original I don't I don't think so. I mean I think that he was he he, he treated this he, he I think he defines this this model but then he starts to fit a linear model uh, to estimate the parameters and things like that. So I'm not sure how, how much he got into this. No. Yeah, well he just said he the avoidance. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if these properties are useful to, to what he was trying to do, um, in particular, actually. You can ask him, is he alive, right? Yeah, I talked to him for a time. Okay, so the two key properties for, for our purposes, uh, I, I've already alluded to them. One is what's called... Uh, weak dissociation. So the permutation is weakly dissociated, which means that if I look at a draw from the Malos distribution, and I look at two segments which are completely separated from one another, okay, and I look at their reduction, Okay, so I have to reduce them down. So the reduction of these two uh, sub of these two subsequences are both random permutations themselves, and they're in, and under the Malos distribution, they're independent of one another. Okay. So for a the reduction of the subsequence to the left is independent of the reduction of what's to the right. And in the case of the uniform distribution, we have the stronger property, which they don't have to be completely separated, they just have to not share any indices, right? So in the, if, we, if, if we have Q, in the Q equals 1 case, uh, we could take a subsequence, say like this, and these, say these locations, and then we could take one uh, like this. So these are inter they, these interleave with one another, but they don't share any indices. And the, redu the reduction of those uh, subsequence will be independent. But that's not necessarily the case in general. And the second one, which is what allows us to uh, compute or at least estimate the probabilities that we want to estimate, is, what's, is what I'll call homogeneity. So under homogeneity, if I take any subsequence, consecutive subsequence of length k, and I reduce it, then I still have a Mallow's permutation of length, I said, I said k, but of length m, then I have a Mallow's permutation of length m with the same parameter. Okay, but that's only true for consecutive uh, subsequences. And again, in the uniform case, it's true of any arbitrary subsequence. So any, if you take any subsequence of a uniform permutation, it reduces to a uniform permutation. So this, this is a little bit less, less obvious. This is less obvious than the dissociation property, but it can be proven from the sequential construction that we have up here. Because what you can imagine doing is, from this construction, we don't disrupt. Once we, once we um, settle on, on 